In the place I come from, death has absolute dominion. It is death that has created a new identity for me and has given me a voice. The voice of our biblical mother, Rachel, weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are not. This new identity and voice transcend nationalities, religions, and even time, and overshadow all other identities deafen, and deafen all other voices I have been given by life. My new voice and identity are not the product of forgiveness. No dead child has ever authorized me to forgive in her or his name. That is why I go around the world and I denounce the master killers of children. Politicians and army generals who never, not even on Yom Kippur, have asked to be forgiven for their crimes. None of them has ever bent his head over the grave of a child with sorrow or regret. I also blame international institutions that do not do enough to save children from these killers. I blame the Nobel Prize Committee, which rewards these murderers, and I blame religious leaders and institutions for not fighting Jewish, Christian, and Muslim fundamentalism that fuels the ecstasy of master killers and torturers all over the world. People sometimes worry that my words may inflame hate and terror that would hurt these very institutions. But the voice of mothers has never inspired hate nor inflamed evil aspirations. Only hate and evil deeds breed hate and evil deeds. My voice is not the voice of forgiveness, but it calls for the redefinition of the camps. My camp is neither Jewish nor Israeli, but that of mothers who will never be comforted for the death of their children by the killing of other mothers' children. This voice has never been heard by politicians and generals and bureaucrats. It is time for it to be heard above all others, for this is the only voice that really understands the meaning of the end of all things, including war, and therefore the meaning of tolerance. Tolerance means having true dialogues in which differences are accepted and respected and negotiated, where talks of reconciliations are not meant to deceive or bring people to their knees. It means that it really doesn't matter to me what flag is put on which mountain, and it doesn't matter who looks where when they pray, or what type of cloth anyone wears or his or her head. It means that nothing is more important than securing a child's way to his or her school. But the human psyche, as, excuse me, scientist Richard Dawkins tells us, has two great sicknesses. The urge to carry vendetta across generations and the tendency to fasten group labels on people rather than see them as individuals. Those of us who suffered because of those sicknesses know that the way to fight labels is to refuse them. The way to defeat false value systems is to expose them and offer others in their stead. Therefore, sorry. How do I do that? I would like to dedicate my words. Oops. To Muataz Greka his two-year-old son, Islam, and his brother, Muntaz, who were killed 10 days ago on the 30th of August by an American missile launched by an Israeli pilot on their way from the hospital where little Islam was treated for injuries caused during the Israeli revengeful attack on Gaza. These children were born prisoners and died prisoners in their homes, on their land, just because they were Palestinians. Frightening soldiers, high electric fences, and blocked roads, raids and ruins were the daily experience of their short life. But right now, I would like to tell them not to worry. Rest in peace, children. Everyone is equally worthy in your new world. This is the world where Israeli Jewish children dwell side by side with Muslim Palestinian children. There they lay victims of racism and greed. Their bloods have been long absorbed by the Holy Land, which has always been indifferent to blood. And all of you children are victims of deceit because the world and its lords go on living as if your blood has never been shed. 
because the leaders of the world keep playing their murderous games, using you as their dice and our grief is fuel for the killing machine. Because children are abstract entities for generals and grief is a political tool. Today's mothers, Israeli, American, English mothers, are taught to raise their children with all the love and care in order to sacrifice them to the god of death, as if their uterus was a national or other international asset. Today's fathers are taught to urge their children to commit themselves to armies whose interests have very little to do with defense or with humanistic goals to make a better world for anybody. And when these children die for the profits of somebody else, their parents bear it with dignity and pride as they were taught. Put their dead children's photographs on the mantelpiece and sigh. He was so handsome in uniform. It is time we dare ask can anyone be handsome in the uniform of brutality? Isn't our dignity and pride misplaced? And most of all, isn't there another way? In Israel and in Palestine, there is a growing number of Jewish and Palestinian conscientious people who offer alternatives to the official racist discourse and to the anti-Arab education, or try to re-educate themselves to tolerance, to dialogue, and to real brotherhoods with their, their neighbors. Such are the Israeli peace activists who together with Palestinian peace activists founded a group of veterans, combatants for peace, such are the brave soldiers who break the silence and tell the tales. Such are the Israeli bereaved parents mentioned before who join Palestinian bereaved parents and fight for peace and reconciliation, knowing what it means to pay the price of racism, greed, and megalomania. And of course, doctors and rabbis for human rights who know the value of a life worth living. But as for now, none of these people are officially acclaimed or have a say in matters of formal education. Let us hope that the popular uprising in the Arab countries and the one inspired by it in Israel will not only transcend religious and ethnic or racist differences, but will once and for all establish equality between the different groups. For some years now, I have been trying to find in Israeli school books some explanation to the question, how can young people who were educated to love their neighbor as they love themselves kill and torture their neighbors, destroy their libraries and the hospitals, humiliate their mothers and fathers and grandfathers, and desecrate their houses of prayer for no apparent reason other than their being neighbors. And in so doing, as we all heard yesterday, lose their human image. The only explanation I found is that their minds are infected not only by parents, teachers, and leaders, but by the very text they are supposed to enlighten them, to teach them about the area they live in and about their neighbors. These books, be it geography, civics, grammar, or history and literature, teach them for a very tender age to ignore, resent, and despise everything and everyone who is not Jewish. The Palestinian citizens of Israel are called in Israeli school books, as in the public discourse, Arabs, the non-Jewish population or sector, or with the demeaning label, Israel's Arabs. All these labels are meant to annihilate their distinct existence as Palestinians. The whole world, but especially the country that Israeli children are ordered to love, is divided in their school books into Jewish and non-Jewish, even agriculture, industry, the professions. Israeli children who may never meet a Palestinian or talk to one until they are drafted to the army in order to carry on the Israeli policy of occupation, learn for 12 long years that these neighbors and co-citizens are primitive, conniving, and vile, underdeveloped intruders and potential terrorists that, const that constitute the enemy from within. They learn about the Palestinian problem and how it should be solved but they are never shown a photograph of a Palestinian human being except in racist cartoons and blurred photographs of primitive farmers and nomads. And that only 60 years after the Jews were a problem to be solved. 